As Deputy Director of the Energy Institute, Co-Director of the Clean Energy Incubator, Josie Centennial Fellow in Energy Resources and Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Dr. Michael Weber trains the next generation of energy leaders at the University of Texas, Austin. He's authored more than 200 publications, holds four patents, and serves on the advisory board for the Scientific American. Weber holds a BS and a BA from UT Austin and an MS and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Weber. Thank you, Cal. I appreciate that the applause. Yeah, like, I haven't even done anything yet. I appreciate the applause. Uh, I'll see if I can earn it. Uh, this is a very complicated advancer, which usually has one button. This has many buttons. And I guess you learn in the utility world, you don't press a button if you don't know what it does, right? Because you never know what might happen to the power plant. So I'm going to talk about energy and water, which is my research specialty at the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm a faculty member there. And I'm actually an alum. I was a student there as well. And I think I have 83 slides in 44 minutes. So I'm going to go fast. Uh, but hopefully, we'll leave just a couple minutes for questions uh, if we have them. So I'll start by explaining why I think energy and water are important. And I'll go back to a man named Rick Smalley, who was a Nobel Prize winner, Nobel laureate, a professor at Rice University. And I had the chance to work with his group on my final PhD project, actually. And Smalley made his claim to fame discovering buckyballs, C60, Buckminster Fullerene. And in the last few years of his life, before he died of leukemia about a decade ago, almost exactly a decade ago now, he went around talking about the world's top challenges. And he listed them in this particular order, which is energy, then water, then food, environment, poverty, terrorism, and war, disease, education, democracy, and population. He said these are the challenges for humanity over the next 100 years. And he put them in this order with a certain logic to it, thinking that if you solve one problem, you could solve the problem beyond it. In energy's at the top. If we could solve our energy problems, all our other problems are solved. If we have abundant, affordable, clean energy, then we can solve our water problems because because we can desalt the oceans and pump water thousands of miles and move water from one place to another. Once you have energy and water available at the right quantities and the right cleanliness, you can then grow all the food you want because you can use energy for the fertilizer and diesels and water for the irrigation. And once you have energy and water and food grown the right way, you protect the environment, which alleviates poverty, which prevents terrorism and war and that kind of thing. So he had a logic to the thinking of these 10 problems energy and water at the top, and that's why I make them my priorities for my research and my teaching. A simpler way to think about why they're valuable to us, because water is life and energy as well. So you can see the headlines that affirm this. Here's a recent one, September 29th, just a couple weeks ago. Liquid water exists on Mars, boosting hopes for life there, NASA says. Because there's water, there might be life, and without water, there would be no chance for life. So water is life. And then we can also think about energy and wealth. Here's GDP per capita on the Y axis. This is in $2,005, thousands of dollars. Uh, versus energy consumption per capita and a million BTU of energy consumption per person per year. And there's a slight correlation between how much energy we consume on the x-axis and how rich we are on the y-axis. In some countries like the United States or up here, we're pretty rich and we consume a lot of energy, although there are some countries like Bahrain and Iceland that consume more energy than we do. Iceland consumes energy because it's really cold there and they have a lot of energy, geothermal energy spelling out of the ground. And there's this rough correlation. European countries and Japan and Korea are here. There are some countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia that consume a lot of energy that aren't that, and aren't that rich. So there's a correlation here, but it's not a great correlation, which suggests that there's more to the story of energy and wealth. It actually is more like electricity and wealth. Let me show you this satellite view from NASA. This is a satellite space station heading east over Asia, coming up on the Korean Peninsula. So this is north and that is south. We come out on the Korean Peninsula. Here's South Korea, all lit up right there. And here's North Korea. It's dark. That's Pyongyang right here. So where there's lights, there's electricity, and there are people with freedom. Where it's dark, there are people without wealth and freedom. So electricity and wealth go more hand to hand even than energy consumption. Energy consumption, when you move from heat for comfort towards electricity for other quality life things, really leads to wealth. And so this correlation is interesting. We use more energy when we're richer. And it's not clear if we use more energy because we're rich or we're rich because we use more energy. But there's a hand to hand correlation. So water is life, energy is wealth, and they're interconnected. We use energy for water and water for energy. I care so much about it. I actually wrote a book called Thirst for Power, Energy, Water, and Human Survival. It's coming out in April. So I'll come back and ask you guys to buy 20 copies of that book. Um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> the idea is I, I should give them up. I don't have copies yet. I'll, yeah, I'll give you 20 copies for free as long as you buy them. The, um, we use energy for water. We use water for energy. And the bad news is they're cross-cutting vulnerabilities. A water constraint becomes an energy constraint. An energy constraint becomes a water constraint. And the good news is there are cross-cutting solutions. We can solve one problem by solving the other. So this is the theme of the talk today. 
Now there's good and bad news for the energy water nexus in a quantitative perspective. With sufficiently abundant, clean, affordable energy, all our water problems are solved, like I mentioned earlier. And with sufficiently abundant, clean, affordable water, all our energy problems are solved because we can dam up the rivers and we can plant biofuels and that kind of thing. Then the bad news is these coupled infrastructures, a water problem becomes an energy problem, energy problem becomes a water problem. There's also a qualitative relationship where energy improves the quality of water because we can use energy to heat, treat, and clean that water and then move it to where we want it. And then the bad news is energy pollutes the water. There's thermal pollution and chemical pollution from runoff and that kind of thing. And water affects energy quality. Water improves the efficiency of power plants, so water makes energy better. And we can use water to improve the extraction of oil and gas in the mining of coal and uranium. And if water is not available the right way, it degrades the performance of energy. So there is this relationship qualitatively and quantitatively. Now we use water for energy in a variety of ways. We use water to drive hydroelectric turbines and dams. We use water to make steam to drive steam turbines in the power sector. We use water to cool the power plants. We use water to grow biofuels, extract oil and gas. In fact, the oil and gas industry produces more water than it does oil and gas. And are really water companies that happen to have oil and gas as a byproduct. And then we use water for refining, upgrading, and improving our fuels. And then we use water for transporting fuels. And this becomes an important point I'll show you in just a little bit. The thermoelectric power sector itself is very water intensive. About half of all the water withdrawals every day in the United States is just to cool power plants. That's non-consumptive use. It's something like less than a gallon per kilowatt hour. Up to over 40 gallons per kilowatt hour is withdrawn for the power plants. The consumptive use is much smaller, less than a gallon per kilowatt hour. About 3% overall of United States water consumption is just to cool power plants. And that varies by location, the fuel you're using, the efficiency of the power cycle, the cooling technology, that kind of thing. So a lot of factors that go into it. Overall, globally, water withdrawals for energy production are about 15% of the world's withdrawals, growing to uh, a large number, about 20% uh, by 2035. So we see water is used for energy and is expected to grow as we use more energy and as we use more water consumptive or water intensive forms of that energy. There are two main cooling approaches for power plants, which is a big one. There's open loop cooling. You take cold water in from a river or lake, you cool your power plant, it gets heated up, you return that hot water to the system, and that's fine, it's efficient for the power plant, but if you return it too hot, it actually cooks the fish or does ecosystem damage to the place, so that's a challenge, and it requires a lot of water. A more advanced way might be a cooling tower, where it takes the water and recirculates it many times, and the evaporation from the water gives you the cooling, like a whole swamp cooler you might have used at camps or in tents. This withdraws less water but consumes more, so the trade-off between consumption and withdrawals you have to keep in mind if you're a power plant operator. You could do air cooling or hybrid air water cooling. And these numbers, there's no quiz or anything, but listed here by fuel and by cooling technology and by power cycle to tell you the water intensity in nuclear and solar thermal at the top. Nuclear doesn't have a way to shed heat to the atmosphere through its smokestack, so it sheds all its waste heat to the waterways. So nuclear is very water intensive, more about twice as intensive as coal, which is twice as intensive as natural gas combined cycle. And then you get down to solar PV and wind that don't need water cooling at all. Solar thermal is very water intensive, so for solar thermal to work the right way, you need a big desert with a lot of water, which doesn't happen very often. So they tend to build those with dry cooling or other systems. And then you can go to open loop or closed loop systems. So there's a, a lot of variables that affect the water intensity of power plants. We also use water for producing fuel. The fonts are way too small to read, but on the bottom is gallons of water consumed per mile traveled. And at the top are your fossil fuels, and you get to electricity, natural gas, and you get to your irrigated biofuels, which is on a large scale, orders of magnitude more water intensive than gasoline. You need a few gallons of water per gallon of gasoline. You need a few thousand gallons of water per gallon of ethanol. You need a few hundred thousand gallons of water per gallon of fuel from algae. So there's a, a big water intensity for the biofuels compared to gasoline. We use energy for water, so it goes the other way around as well. We use energy to pump and treat and heat and move water, get it to the place we want it in the form we want it. And in many parts of the world, that energy is invested by women who fetch water. If you want an image of poverty, it's always a woman carrying water or a girl in some cases. This is the universal sign for poverty. Women carrying water in buckets on their heads or across their shoulders, usually an African woman or a Southeast Asian woman, something like this. That is an issue because every time they walk a few miles to get the water, they're at risk of kidnap or assault. Then they bring it home, the water's dirty. They have to walk a few miles to get fuel wood, bring that home. They burn that fuel wood in an inefficient cook stove that kills two million women and children prematurely every year. So there are people dying from the air pollution of burning wood in bad cook stoves, or maybe it's cow dung or cereal straw in their huts and villages and houses and tents to get water cleaned up, and that's a challenge. So this is a, a women's rights problem around the world. And this poor African or Asian woman today was an American woman 100 years ago. This is a, a promotional poster put up at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1920, 95 years ago. The farm woman's dream, it says, 
make your dream come true, consult your county agent, or write your call to agriculture for information on water supply systems for farm homes is what the United States government says. And the idea is this woman here has walked in the cold down an icy path to a hand-pumped well to get water that she's carrying in a bucket. Again, a woman carrying it in a bucket in poverty. Cold, miserable, walking up to her house where her dream is comfortably in the kitchen in shirt sleeves and a nice dress, opening the tap at the flick of a valve, getting hot water, steam curling to the ceiling. So this poor African woman today was the American woman 95 years ago. We're not that far away from the situation. And the difference is the advanced energy systems and the piped water systems liberated women that was good for society. In the 1930s in Austin, 20% of our electricity was just for pumping water and lighting, street lighting as well. But that's a sign of how energy intensive water can be. In fact, overall, as a nation, water is responsible for more than 12% of our total energy use. This is a big number. We use a lot of energy for heating and treating and moving and storing that water. Nearly a third of that 12%, or about 4% of national energy consumption, is just water heating. We spend an incredible amount of energy just heating our water to make it comfortable. So that's an opportunity for conservation and for savings across society. The amount of energy we spend to treat water depends on what kind of water it is and how deep it is and how salty it is. Surface water that's fresh, like on rivers and lakes, is the least energy intensive in kilowatt hours per million gallons of treat. Groundwater takes more energy because we have to pump the water to the surface, then treat it. And then the brackish groundwater is even more energy intensive because we have to remove the salts. Seawater is even more energy intensive again because it has higher levels of salts than the brackish groundwater. Then you get to oil and gas, frack water, things like that. Even higher levels of salts than seawater takes more energy. And by the way, after we treat that water, we drink it, we flush it down the toilet, it gets treated again with wastewater, another 1,000 to 2,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons. By the way, we can use that wastewater, treat it, treat it again, and it's still less energy intensive than desalination. That's something to keep in mind is water reuse might be a more energy efficient option than going to the sea to boil the sea to get the salts out of it. The amount of energy required varies across the nation. This is for water than kilowatt hours per million gallons. In Austin, Texas, we're about 5,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons for water and wastewater. In the Northeast, it's much lower because the water is clean and flows by gravity. New York's water supply is gravity fed. They don't need energy to pump it, and it's relatively clean, so they don't have to spend energy to treat it. All that energy in New York, Massachusetts is basically for the wastewater treatment to clean up the sewage. You get to California, and you get to really big numbers because the water moves across the state and over mountain ranges to get to LA or San Diego. So when you get to places down here, and desalination actually starts to look like a more energy efficient option than moving it across the state, which is sort of interesting. So great variability in the energy intensity for water across the nation. If we instead want to save energy, we could probably just make beer. Here's a shirt from the back of a waitress in North Carolina from 2012, which I really liked. It is Tyler's Tap Room. In wine, there is wisdom. In beer, there is strength. In water, there is bacteria, says this German proverb. I think it's interesting. So if you want to avoid the water, you could just drink beer instead. And beer and mead and ale were actually developed in the Middle Ages as a way of cleaning the water. The fermentation process, the heating process killed the bad stuff. So it was a water treatment process. So if you're having alcohol tonight at the reception, you're just doing your part for the environment <laughs> and perhaps for your career. Yeah, you're just looking out for yourself in that way. Uh, the energy water relationship is connected today. It's already under strain. We got some examples where it's a problem. This is a boil water notification I got at my house just a handful of years ago. Due to a loss of water pressure from a power outage at the water plant in the Ridgewood Village water system where I live, uh, we have to boil our water. We got this notice until further notice. Now that's easy for us. We just turn a knob on our stove and boil water, but for that little girl in Africa, that means miles and hours of effort of collecting the fuel and that kind of thing. So here an energy outage becomes a water outage. Then we have the situation of the power sector where they depend so much on water, you have to have water in just the right spot. And water can be too hot, too cold, too abundant, or too scarce. So you have this Goldilocks situation where water needs to be just right in the sweet spot. And I've got examples for you of all the different ways it can go wrong for the power sector. Hot water is a problem. There's a heat wave in France in 2003, a killer heat wave. It killed over 10,000 people in France, over 35,000 people across Europe. The temperature map there is showing a picture from NASA at the time, and wherever it's red, it was a temperature anomaly where it was 10 degrees Celsius hotter than normal. That's 18 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than normal in a place that's not used to that kind of heat. So people are literally dying from the heat, and they're turning up their air conditioning. So the demand for power is spiking for air conditioning. At the same time, the nuclear fleet in France, which is on rivers for river cooling, the rivers are hotter than normal. So the rivers are so hot, the power plants have to dial back on their output. At the same time, demand is spiking. It was a problem. France eventually said, let's suspend our environmental rules. Go ahead and boil the escargot in the rivers directly. You don't need to take it home. We can return hot water. We need the power. People are dying. So that case, the water was too hot. Water can also be too cold. We had a freeze in Texas 2011 that knocked out coal plants and then natural gas supplies. We had a couple of instrumentation lines of power plants like the diameter of my wrist or my finger that froze. Little tiny pipes, 
two gigawatts of coal plants go offline. At the same time, because there's power outage, there are natural gas compressors that turn off because they don't have the electricity and they can't move natural gas. 50 to 60 natural gas plants tried to come on to back up those two coal plants and could not because they couldn't get the gas because gas demand was already high because it was cold and so pressures in the pipelines were low. At the same time, at our shale production sites, all this water came out with the gas, froze, you had a freeze off. We couldn't get gas out of the well, into the pipes, or from the pipes to the power sector, so we had rolling blackouts because it was too cold. Also, we had the polar vortex in January 14, that's above Niagara Falls. They had to get ice breakers out because they were worried about ice breaking the hydroelectric dam. And here's a case, ice breakers on uh, uh, the Great Lakes and Lake Superior. You had a situation where one power plant couldn't get its coal. They shipped 25,000 tons, 25, tons of coal by truck from one power plant to another just to keep things going because of frozen water. The water was too cold. It's not just the power sector, it's also uh, liquid fuels are a problem. He had a situation in, I believe it was Ohio, a river froze. Because the river froze, a barge delivering road salt could not deliver the salt. Because the salt couldn't be delivered, the roads were icy. Because the roads were icy, trucks powered by diesel carrying propane could not deliver propane. Because you couldn't deliver propane, you had a shortage of heating fuel, people literally dying in mis upper Midwest and Wisconsin, place like that, and prices spiked from $8 down south to $27 in Chicago and higher in Wisconsin. So it's a liquid fuels issue as well. If, if water's too cold, it's a constraint in the system. You can also have floods. Uh, the same year that we had a freeze in Texas in 2011, there was a flood in the summer along the Missouri River in Nebraska. This is a nuclear power plant. There's an inflatable berm here that's in gray, you can barely see, where it's gray on the outside is water, it's white on the inside, it's dry. They it built an inflatable berm and the water of the river rose to the top, almost crested over, but then receded. They were within one day of shutting off this power plant because of floods. And of course, at Fukushima, the problem wasn't the earthquake, it was the flood, it was the tsunami, it was the water. So too much water can also be a problem. You can also have droughts threaten the, the power sector. You can have too much water, you can have too little water. If you don't have water, then you don't have cooling for your power plants. Your power plants might have to turn off. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times on July 24th, 2012, that said, well, drought caused the next blackout. One week later to the day, drought caused a blackout in India. 600 million people in the dark without power because they had a hydropower that was producing less capacity because of the drought. At the same time, because of the drought, farmers were ramping up on irrigation using electric pumps. So demand for power was higher from the electric pumps because of the drought. At the same time, power output from the dams was lower. So drought, on top of other problems, triggered this problem, triggered this blackout across India. And then drought hurts the ability to ship energy on barges and rivers. You ship fertilizers and gasoline and diesel and coal. And when the river goes low in the Mississippi, they have to half load the barges because the barges would sink too deep. So a water uh, shortage became an energy shortage as well. Certainly there are droughts other places. This is just Texas. I don't think you guys care so much about Texas, but I think it's relevant for my existence. And this is uh, four years apart to the day almost in August 14, 2007. 99.9% .9 of the state was not in drought. Four years later, 99.9% .9 of the state was in drought, which is phenomenal. In Texas, we were drought free six months ago. Now we're 50% in drought. So in six months, we get major drought. California has a lot of these issues as well. So drought's a problem, it's a risk to the energy sector overall. Now trends apply that the strain's gonna get worse. We already have these strains, so they might get worse because of our different decisions. In a particular, I think water will become one of those great strategic resources that we will fight over. Discover Magazine calls it water wars, the coming battle over Earth's most precious resource, the resource for which we don't have an alternative. And I would like to point out that Hollywood gets this right. Uh, there's Mad Max The Road Warrior in 1981, and then Mad Max Fury Road in 2015, and we've gone from fighting over oil to fighting over water. I don't know if you've seen those movies, but I'll give you some quotes. Without fuel, they were nothing said the narrator on Mad Max Road Warrior in 1981. And I'm just here for the gasoline, says Mel Gibson, to 2015. Do not, my friends, become addicted to water. It will take hold of you and you will resent its absence, says the Morton Joe in Mad Max Fury Road. Or I like this one. Because he owns the water, he owns all of us, says the dad. So Hollywood actually got it right on this one. I think if, that, if that's not a sign that we're fighting over water now, I don't know what is. Now, trends imply that things could get worse because of population growth. There's more of us, and each of us demands energy and water. We're getting richer, and as we get richer, we demand more energy and water per person. That might be counteracted society-wide by efficiency. Uh, richer, more advanced societies tend to be a little more efficient, so you can counteract it societally, uh, societally even if your individual demand goes up. And then there's climate change, which changes the water system, which means we might spend more energy on water to store it or manage it. And then we have our policy choices where we're choosing to go to more energy intensive water and more water intensive energy. So we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot on top of the other challenges. Uh, the bad news, uh, that's my optimistic slide, that one. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll try to close on some optimism for you. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I try to shock you and then like make you happy at the end. We'll see how it goes. Uh, there's a tension looming in the power sector between CO2 and H2O, between carbon dioxide and water. This is the y-axis shows the CO2 emissions in pounds per megawatt hour, starting with coal at the top, and then coal integrated gasification combined cycle, natural gas turbines, natural gas steam boilers, natural gas combined cycle, and get down to um, coal with capture and solar thermal and nuclear and that kind of thing at the bottom. That's in the carbon intensity from most carbon intensive to least carbon intensive, but look what happens when I add the water consumption in gallons per megawatt hour. The whole thing spreads out where the low carbon options are not necessarily the low water options, in particular nuclear way out there on the right can be a challenge, solar thermal way out there on the right. You have um, coal with ca carbon capture. Carbon capture is very water intensive. So you're getting down to a sweet spot of options that are both clean and lean instead of dirty and thirsty. Things like solar PV and wind and small modular reactors that are nuclear, that are air cooled or natural gas combined cycle. Or you can get to coal with carbon capture and dry cooling would be in this spot as well. So there's a smaller set of answers that are both carbon lean and water lean. And that's a tension that's looming because for carbon policy reasons, we might exacerbate our water policy situation. Now, energy is going through a transition, so there's an opportunity for change. Maybe we could pounce on that. Uh, we, a decade ago, uh, we were already crying about the end of oil, the end of the oil age, the end of cheap oil. After oil set our covers and headlines, we're all going to die. Uh, here's an LA freeway. I used to live out in this area for six years, so I recognize that. Uh, I feel like National Geographic owes a royalty to the economists for stealing their cover idea. I don't know how they worked that out. After oil powering the future, and this is the bomb 60 years later, the fact that there's an article on nuclear power and nuclear weapons in an uh, issue about after oil makes sense. I think they were doing that on purpose. So we're running out of oil. We're all going to die until America strikes oil, the promise and risk of fracking, or we will never run out of oil Why the fossil fuel boom is good for America and bad for Saudi Arabia and scary for the planet. So we've gone from a, a sense of scarcity to a sense of abundance. So energy can change. Now we have this shakes versus shale, Texans versus Saudi Arabians, that kind of thing. We're in a standoff, a duel of some sort, because there's a big a market share war going on in different producing regions of the world. So the headlines are different. The transitions are happening. Our energy needs are changing, our production is changing. At the same time, we have these macro demographic trends where we have population growth, economic growth, like I talked about earlier, urbanization, industrialization, electrification, and motorization. We're moving into cities, we're building factories, we're using electricity for our factories and for our appliances at home, and we're now mobile. Instead of walking, we're using cars. These are macro trends around the world. And that applies a change in how much energy we consume because as those people come to life and get richer, they consume more demand, they consume more energy and water demand goes up. And we're changing how we use our energy. So we're using it for electricity and for transportation instead of for heat and for cooking. And we have policy layers that's changing what kind of energy we use, where it's from, whether it's clean or not. So we're changing how much energy we use, what we're using it for, and where we're getting it from. Those are major shifts to the energy system that we will have to accommodate in some way. I think this yields three trends that are part of this as well. Technology trend number one, I think it's important, is the dec decreasing resource intensity. Products and services will get leaner. They will use less resource per good and service. They will also get smarter. Technology trend number two is increasing information intensity. We're decreasing our resources, but increasing our uh, data. Products and services will get smarter as we embed that data. A counter trend is that, in is that uh, energy becomes more information intensive. Information becomes more energy intensive. We're using more energy for data centers and that kind of thing. Increasing customization is a third trend. Products and services are going to be distributed, on-site, tailored, democratized. And we can talk about what those winners are technology-wise. On-site energy production with solar panels, that is uh, energy efficient, um, information intensive, democratized, distributed source of energy. And that means we'll have problems with storage and demand response and flexible loads. And maybe we could use water treatment or data center that we turn on and off to match the variability of solar. So solar solves one problem but introduces another. On-site water production and collection with rainwater harvesting and reuse and treatment. On-site manufacturing with 3D printers. We used to have centralized power plants, we still do, that made our power. We also had centralized factories, but we're going to on-site production of energy and on-site production of our goods with mass customization instead of uh, mass production with 3D printers and other devices. Also telemedicine, a, a, a hospital is a little bit like a factory, is a little bit like a water treatment plant or a power plant where we all collectively um, assign our resources in one place, but we could instead do our diagnosis remotely, send the information over the wires to get our diagnosis. I think car ownership and usage models will also get disrupted by point-to-point -point mass transit through car sharing, chauffeur services, driverless cars, robot cars, Uber, that you name it. Um, basically, our car ownership model is kind of ridiculous, where we buy a $30,000 car and we use it 4% of the time. 
than we pay to garage it at home, we pay to park it at work, we pay for the insurance and everything else, it'd be instead smarter for us to pay more for a car that we share with other people. And that doesn't mean you're sharing the car for the ride because most of us, let's be honest, don't like other people. So we'd rather just have our own chauffeur. But if we share the ownership of it and then we don't have to pay for the garage at home, don't have to pay for the parking, don't have to pay for the time to walk from the parking garage to work if you live in an urban area like New York, and then you'll gain more time and more freedom. This is actually a trend that kids are onto. So if you have a 16 year old like I do, who doesn't want their driver's license because they already have a chauffeur, mother or father, or driving them around, they figured out the cars are a pain in the neck. It sounds to them like it's very expensive and time intensive. In fact, there was a study done where we were really worried about teens having their driving interrupted by the texting, but it turns out that driving's interrupting their texting. They would rather text than drive, and so they get it. They'd rather have a chauffeur and just do their texting, and that's the way they're connected. For me, having a car was freedom, but for my daughter, having a phone is freedom, and texting with her friends. And so we have a shift in the models happening right now as the car's identity with liberty and that kind of thing shifts in society and as it gets too expensive to maintain. There are other things we're gonna go from uh, waste and energy. In the future, there'll be no difference between waste and energy. This is what HSBC says. We have half our energy consumption in the United States is released as waste heat into the air, into the waterways. We have 10 quads, out of 100 quads of energy consumption, we have 10 quads of waste biomass. We got waste water, waste nuclear, municipal solid waste. We have a lot of waste that we could use to make society run more efficiently. There's a phrase I like to say, which is, waste is what you have when you run out of imagination. There is no waste in nature. Nature finds a purpose for all uh, waste streams, and so we should do the same with society. And then all of this means there's an increasing democratization of resource decisions and allocation, which I think will liberate society as a whole, and this is a good thing. I, I'm excited about this trend. It means shifting business models, which can be complicated for a lot of people, but I think overall it's quite good. Now, there are technical, social, and policy solutions. We can go through some of those. Um, there's some catchy slogans for water solutions. More crop per drop, showers to flowers, toilets to taps, that kind of thing. More crop per drop means efficiency in agriculture, getting more crop yield per unit of water. Water reuse, showers to flowers, take your gray water from shower and irrigate your flower bed. And toilet to tap is taking toilet water to a treatment plant, treating it again, and then drinking it like they do um, on the space station, or like they do in Singapore, like they do in more and more cities where they take the effluent and treat it again, and then we drink it. We already do that in society. If you live down river from anyone, their wastewater went into that river, then that river water went into your water treatment plant, and then it was treated, then you drank it. You're already drinking toilet water from someone, but if it goes into their nature first, somehow it feels okay to us. But if it stays in a pipe the whole time, we think it's probably bad. I feel like uh, Houston is downstream of Dallas, for example. They're drinking Dallas's toilet water. I wonder if they know that. There are a couple of different technical solutions. We could do source switching. We could switch our fuels to water lean sources, and we could switch uh, our water sources from fresh water to brackish and that kind of thing. We go to water lean energy technologies or energy lean water technologies. Uh, this is like better treatment technologies for water that don't require as much energy, for example, or more efficient cooling systems that need, don't need as much water at power plants. We go to distributed technologies, smart technologies, adding that information so we get better control and resource allocation at the end use. And then we can integrate the two systems. Instead of, instead of having interconnected systems where a problem one becomes a problem the other, we could have integrated systems where we use one to solve the other. In particular, I think water systems will get smarter. Uh, today's meters are pretty dumb. We need to know water use by time of day, by function. Uh, this is the opportunity for us. Like if you're in Austin, we need more data. Most people don't have the data. They have meters that are 90 years old. We need to dis uh, distinguish our water use by function, indoor versus outdoor, heated versus unheated, gray water versus black water, pipe versus collected. The old days of spinning vein meters that don't tell you any information is not the way we need to go. We need to get better meters with more information that we can then use to track our use and make better decisions. They're becoming more popular. I think this is good news. This is an old article back in 2009 that Texas would install three and a half million smart water meters by 2010. We certainly need that. And I think that's a growing opportunity to get more data, manage your information with more services, and then you can reduce your usage. There are also policy solutions and challenges. Um, I think one of the challenges is we don't really invest enough in water in particular. I, I would say we don't invest enough in energy or water, but water especially is lagging behind energy. Here's a speech in 1961. JFK gave two great uh, challenges to the world. He said in May, no single space project in the period will be more impressive to mankind, talking about the Apollo program, or more important for the long range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. A month before, he basically made another clarion call, this time around water. If we could ever competitively, at a cheap rate, get fresh water from salt water, that would be in the long range interest of humanity. It would really dwarf any other scientific accomplishment. Well, one speech led to a very successful space program, and one speech basically made no difference. We didn't really listen. 
I think that's important. That timing is interesting. Uh, space program, certainly we know what happened to work. By 1969, we put a man on the moon and, and brought that person back. But we spent more money looking for water on the moon than water on the Earth, I think, which I think is sort of interesting. And then the concern or caution I have for you is that it might take us a while to get there because we have to remind ourselves of things. Here's a sign above a toilet that says, caution, reclaimed wastewater, do not drink. And I think it's funny, if you have to tell people not to drink the toilet water, then probably uh, we have a lot of learning to do. You know, if you ever open like a box of shoes and it has a little silica package in there to keep it dry and it says, do not eat. Do you know why they say do not eat on that? Because we would eat it. That's how dumb we are, right? So we have to be told not to do this kind of stuff. Like, do not drink the toilet water. Do not eat this packet of crystals. So uh, I think that's a sign that we have a collective think we need to go through. As a reminder of this, is that uh, energy technologies change very slowly. If we look at some of the technologies that drive the world, of the world's $60 trillion economy, or however big the economy is now, 60% of it is powered by four devices, the steam turbine, the gas turbine, the spark ignition internal combustion engine, the, which is the gasoline engine, and the compression ignition internal combustion in engine, which is the diesel engine. Those four devices, which I could call just combustion engines and turbines, are responsible for more than 60% of all our US, our US energy conversion. And those were invented as recently as 1893. 1791 for the gas turbine, 1884 for the steam turbine, 1876 for gasoline engine, 1893 for the diesel engine. These are old technologies, 120 years old or older, that are driving the modern world economy. This is a sign of how long things take. Well, maybe we could make a leap forward. Oh, just look at, oops, sorry, go back. Just look at the steam turbine. One third of all energy in the nation is going just to boil water at power plants to use those steam turbines, by the way, which I think is interesting. A third of our energy in the nation is just to boil water to make electricity. Uh, boiling water is not new. That's been around for thousands of years. So that's a sign of how far we can go. If we make a leap to modern renewable energy, it's really not that modern. Wind generators have been around since 1888 and solar cells since 1883. So there's not a new idea under the sun. Maybe, oh, except for space age stuff like fuel cells, which went on uh, the Apollo system to the moon and back, and those were invented in 1839. So we don't really have a lot of breakthroughs, and it, maybe it's time for a new innovation. I would say uh, even electric vehicles are not that modern. Uh, this was 1839 that Jules said, oops, I'm missing the date. I can hardly doubt that electromagnetism will ultimately be substituted for steam to propel machinery. That was 1839 that Jewell, the scientist, said that. So what do we do while we're waiting for these technologies to come along? Well, we can start with conservation, because conservation works at many scales. It works at a small scale. We can adjust the thermostat. We can turn off the lights when we leave the room, so individuals can do conservation. We can do it at a medium scale by choosing a different car or maybe reducing the amount of stuff we consume and reuse it and recycle it. And a large scale, we can make cities more compact and smarter with more metering and sensors and make power plants more efficient. So we can do conservation at every scale and every time scale, by the way. We could start today and do it over decades as well. So conservation is a promising opportunity. And the good news is that conserving water will conserve energy. Because we use more energy in our water, in our faucets and taps than in our light bulbs in our homes, and because we use more water in our light bulbs than in our taps, which is non-obvious, by the way. Saving one saves the other. Turning off the light saves water. Turning off the water saves energy. So that's good news. You get cross-cutting conservation. In fact, if your goal is to save water, saving energy might be a cheaper way to get there and vice versa. And we can do it soon. This is my last comment. It's about my daughter, Evelyn, who is now 16 and doesn't talk to me. But when she was seven, she would talk to me. And we would brush our teeth together every night. And we'd, we'd get our toothbrush wet and then turn off the water and then brush our teeth and then rinse the toothbrush and put it away, our nightly ritual every day. And one day I did not turn off the water fast enough to her liking and she turned off the water and glared at me and made a fist and said, turn off the water, daddy. The scientists need time. When she was seven, I thought, wow, that's really incredible. First of all, I was like, okay, whose daughter are you? And then, uh, wow, you really figured out, kids have figured this out. For her, this is the answer. Conservation is the answer. Now, it's not the final answer. It's hard to light a light bulb with conservation, for example, but conservation buys us time and while we buy ourselves time, we can come up with better solutions. So I'll stop there, and I think that leaves us a couple minutes for uh, Q&A or insults, if you have any insults, <laughs> or comments, but let's stop there. Any questions? Well, uh, we're being live streamed, so careful what you ask. Suggestions? Corrections? You guys are an easy audience. If you want your coffee or something, I can tell, that's bad. You weren't paying attention, yeah, I'll, I'll mail you the slides instead of you, I'm over at your leisure. Is that it? For the live streaming audience, anybody? You feel convinced? All right. That these are big problems, but we can solve them? No, we can't. Oh. All right. Good. 
Was it optimistic enough at the end? Because you were you flagging me down earlier that I wasn't very happy. That was a better low <laughs> conservation. <laughs> I see it as a path to a better technology-enabled future, right? That's sort of where we are. And, and with that comes some liberties, I would say. So. Yes? Isn't that crazy? So we had, a, we had a wave of innovation for about 30, 40 years, late 1800s, early 1900s. And we haven't had that kind of innovation until recently with IT. So the next wave of innovation might be internet-enabled connections and software and IT, which is rippling through the different sectors and making it to the energy and water sectors bit by bit. So that revolution is happening now. And maybe we're in it and we're starting to see what the effect is. So there are these long spans where you have a wave of innovation and then you benefit for decades from that innovation. And now we're due for another wave of innovation and maybe we'll benefit for decades after this one. But this one won't be mechanical, it'll be intelligent is what I think. Not that the mechanical ones didn't have thought behind it, but it, uh, those breakthroughs were around materials and resources. This one will be around data and management and services. That's what I suspect. So there's a big transition from manufacturing to service that is happening as a society. And the utilities that are smart will be on that service side and will yield higher profit margins and that kind of thing. It's a trade off in there, though. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, uh, so there are technical solutions, but the technical solutions are meaningless if you don't have innovations and markets and policies also. It's a three headed dragon, right? You gotta have all three. Good market, smart market, smart policy, smart technologies. They go together well, you get good solutions. If they're fighting against each other, you get stagnation. And the policy piece is probably the hardest piece, I would say. And as a former policymaker, I was a commissioner for five years in Austin for Austin Energy, and I saw this process. And so I was part of the problem or part of the solution. I can't remember, but I was there. And um, getting the policies innovated to allow changes is very difficult and tricky because they spent 100 years building these policies with purpose behind them, which was around widely available, affordable access to energy and resources. And now we're saying now that you have access, where well, we're less worried about access for liability and more worried about smart management and capital utilization and efficiency and cleanliness and that kind of thing. So we have a new ethic driving the new policies that are about to evolve. And that transition is tricky when you have politically elected regulators who respond to many different stakeholders. And so we have this challenge where the regulatory situation is not really designed for it and therefore the markets can't accommodate because the markets don't really exist. They're dysfunctional or they're highly regulated. They're not really markets. And therefore there's no uh, price signal to send uh, us a direction about our behavior or the technologists about innovation. So it's all tied up and I would say policy is the biggest holdup and the hardest one to change because it hears many different voices, has many different stakeholders. That will happen slowly with breakthrough innovations. Usually what happens is policies get upended by the technology. Some technology comes through, ruins it for everybody and they're like, uh oh, we better remake our policies to address. So I think that's the challenge. Technology by itself won't get us there unless we have markets that will pull them in and policies that will enable the markets to work in a highly functional way. The risk is, the concern is, that poor people will get priced out of the market or reliability goes down. And that's the concern. The reason why we have our regulated markets is to guarantee affordable access to energy. But the problem with affordable access to energy is it doesn't embed other social goals like domestic sources of energy or clean energy or sustainable energy or um, better use of our money and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, yeah, so if, if we think energy markets are dysfunctional, water markets are especially dysfunctional. Um, and I think there, there's some lessons to be learned out there with other countries even, with Israel, where they've gone so hard to conserve and find every drop of water, put it to good use, you don't waste water, you turn off your shower while you're lathering, and then you turn the shower back on to rinse and that kind of thing. And they have solar water heaters everywhere to save energy for the water heating. Then you go to France, I think it's funny that Capitalistic United States has socialized water, but socialist France has capitalized water. And I think that's really hilarious. I hope you'll join me in the irony of that statement, which is that in socialist France where they have privatized water markets, the global leading water brands are Perrier, Evian, Vitel, Veolia. It has worked for these companies to still innovate and create a global brand. In the United States where we don't do that, despite our rhetoric, we have good water systems, the best water system in the world, but they're not highly innovated always. The, the water utility doesn't have permission to innovate because its regulator won't let them. They can't put it into the rate base, that kind of thing. And so if you look at um, the dog food industry, which puts a small percentage of its revenues into R&D, that R&D is much higher than the entire power industry or the water industry. The potato chip industry puts more money into R&D than water or electricity combined. So I think that's really amazing. One pharmaceutical company, 
the water limit. They're steeped in tradition, a tradition of reliability in particular. There's a reliability effort. Yeah, so I spent 40 years mastering this, and now you want me to learn something else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wait till it breaks. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. So there's vested interests or legacy stakeholders. There's a comfort and familiarity. You have an ethic of reliability. Why would I put that at risk? Well, because the world's changed and now we care about carbon and maybe we didn't care 40 years ago. Or because we have power plants we use 45% of the time. If we use them 80% of the time, it'd be cheaper for everybody or that kind of thing. So that's the fear. I'm not sure that's true. We have. Yeah. Yeah, so some of the thought leaders on this, and I think there's a hand back there I want to get to in a second, but some of the thought leaders are the poorer communities because they don't have the money for waste on bad ideas. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah. Yep. Because they see the value in it. Rural electric co-ops around, at least in Texas, the rural electric co-ops are more advanced on this than the urban um, facilities in many cases, which I think is a part of that. When my mom was growing up, she grew up in St. Louis in a relatively poor to middle class neighborhood. And she always said, you could tell the poor kids from the rich kids. And I'm like, well, how can you tell the poor kids from the rich kids? She goes, because the poor kids had better shoes. I'm like, well, why is that? They said, because they could afford one pair of shoes and they would buy the best. So it would last. I always thought, like, wow, the poor have a better sense of resource allocation than the rich. And so the poor will lead on this in many ways if we're thoughtful and think about that. I think I'm supposed to stop in like, do I have three minutes? Is it zero minutes? How much time do I have? Another question here? So three minutes. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. What do we do with all that bad water, that contaminated, irradiated, contaminated water? Yeah. It's a storage problem or something. I, I really don't know, but you, where it's stored now won't last 10,000 years. And so we have to figure out some long term not storage for waste, but storage for the water. And water likes to move, and that's a challenge. Water likes to corrode materials, and water finds its way through cracks and that kind of thing. I really don't know what they're going to do. And um, a lot of people have very, been very angry at Japan, feel like Japan wasn't been very forthcoming about data and details and that kind of thing. I don't know what the answer is. I do know people who might know, but I'll have to ask them, so I don't have a very good answer for you. But I think that water problem is a bigger problem than the solid waste for sure. Nuclear solid waste, you can uh, vitrify, you can store it, you put it in a cask, and you know, it doesn't flow. But water that likes to flow is more difficult. And even worse are radiated plumes that go around the entire world. So water doesn't move as much as the plumes, but still it, it can flow, so that's a challenge. It's a good question to think about that. Any other questions or comments? to transition to the next business model. All right, well, great. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys. Yeah. Good.